Welcome students to lecture nine of MHHS one. These next few lectures will move on to my own department of English. Since I'm teaching the central course right now, there's gonna be an inevitable slight bias, I think, to, toward my own department, just because literature is my wheelhouse. Um, for the next two lectures, we'll direct our attention to my colleague Susan Zeger's essay, uh, Holmes's Pipe, Tobacco Papers and the 19th Century Origins of Media Addiction. In terms of history, we're staying roughly in the same period as last time of the late 19th century with Antoine Lentacker's essay, but we're moving from France to England and from history to literature. The object of study is the figure of Sherlock Holmes and the character's famous substance abuse problem. You're probably familiar with the character since according to a Guinness World Record in 2012, Holmes is the most portrayed literary human character in film and television. Um, so they specified human there because if we go with non-human as well, the most portrayed literary character in film and television would actually be Dracula. Um, so um, in all of your kind of content consumption, you might have even encountered a Holmes portrayal without even knowing it. Uh, for example, the television series House is actually uh, an adaptation of the Holmes character, uh, right down to the addiction of the main character. While Holmes prefers tobacco and cocaine, House MD prefers Vicodin. Uh, so the intense popularity and consumability of the Holmes character for Zeger is the point. She traces for us a history of the twinned developments of substance addiction and media addiction through our voracious interest in this enduring character. I'll model a similar kind of academic reading that we did last time with Lynn Tucker's essay. This lecture will focus more on the big picture argument, and the next lecture will get into the weeds with Zeger's examples and her close readings. So um, in this case, there's an even bigger picture um, since uh, this 2014 essay um, is an offshoot of Zeger's earlier 2008 book, uh, Inventing the Addict, uh, Drugs, Race, and Sexuality in 19th Century British and American Literature. Um, the book is worth checking out on your own, but I'll just give you a brief overview of that project here to contextualize the argument in the Holmes essay um, that you read for this week. Um, and so uh, in, in this earlier book, uh, Zeger constructs a cultural history of the figure of the addict that goes back in the history longer than we might expect. When we think of the figure of the addict, we usually think of um, contemporary addiction memoirs like uh, William S. Burroughs' Junkie or Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Um, so, and the reason we think of these is that these are the most famous 20th century stories that have become embedded in our cultural imaginations. Uh, but Zeger's claim is that there's a much longer history of this that goes back to at least Thomas de Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater, published in the middle of the 19th century. So um, the question I guess is, why would we actually need a hundred more years of literary history to understand addiction? How could those hundred years possibly matter? Um, in medical and scientific circles, the important question would seem to be if addiction is, a, is simply a material malfunction of bodily machinery, or if it is a matter of individual choice and agency. So is it, in short, the body's fault or the person's fault? So the important task then would be something like to find some chemical or neurological switch that turns addiction on and off. If we could find this answer, then we would have our, our answer. It would be a material bodily issue. So back to the, um, to the question, why does it matter to have um, this deeper literary history that seems to skirt this question? So the implicit answer that Zeger gives in Inventing the Addict is that addiction isn't just some category of being that has existed since the beginning of time. She avoids giving a precise scientific definition of addiction because it, it, it is a category that's always in developmental flux. Instead of finding 
a neurochemical switch that turns addiction on and off, the humanities approach would be to investigate how we even came to the category of addiction and why we value those categories or imbue them with meaning. So in that book, um, the, uh, the Inventing of the Addict, uh, Zieger uh, traces a literary history of addiction to show how the figure of the addict is never some stable scientific category of being, but a reflection of a particular time and place's cultural values. The figure of the addict becomes a way for De Quincey to imagine, for example, his place in an, in an expanding British empire. And in America, the figure of the addict becomes, becomes a way to think about manifest destiny or even abolitionist sentiment. What she succeeds in doing in the book is to show that addiction is not a purely scientific objective category then, but a figure that complexly indexes the cultural preoccupations of the times. We have some of the intellectual background now to understand this essay. So we'll use the same reading technique that we use for Antoine Lintacher's essay. So instead of reading the essay all the way through from beginning to end, we'll just read the beginning and end first and get to the middle, uh, to the middle details later. So this time, I'm going to recommend an, an additional important trick in academic reading that I want you to develop yourselves um, as you move along in your humanities education. And uh, this is the very useful skill of thesis hunting. Um, if you just read from the beginning to the first section break on page 26, so turn, turn to that page right now, um, you should be able to identify a thesis statement, a few sentences that describe what the central argument of the essay is, and what to expect in the development of that argument. So try to find the thesis in this introductory section. Where do you think Zieger states her central argument and clearly articulates the intellectual stakes of her essay? So I actually want you to do this. So pause the video right here for a bit and come up with your answer. So welcome back from the pause, and I, I hope you have your answer now um, in mind, because at this point, I'm just going to reveal the answer now. Um, so compare your answer to mine. The thesis statement that I found is at the top of page 25. So turn to that page right now. Um, quote, the article explores, or this article explores Holmes's dependencies on print and tobacco, interpreting the man with the twisted lip, 1891 as evidence of Holmes's cultural status as the first widely popular media addict. Along the way, I describe the long cultural association of smoking, reading, and fantasizing that gave rise to the concept of media addiction. So this might have been uh, a bit tricky because maybe you were trained in high school to put your thesis statement at the very end of your introduction. But this sentence actually comes at the end of the introduction's penultimate paragraph. There's, there's a whole additional paragraph after this uh, thesis statement before the first section break. Um, so let's just try to think about why and why, why this structure makes sense. So let's, let's break this thesis down and discuss why I've pegged it as the central argument of the piece. So the argument about Sherlock Holmes is that the character is the, quote, first widely popular media addict. And we even get a preview of the evidence that um, Zieger is going to use. We're going to get an explanation of Holmes's twin addictions um, to print and to tobacco, and a clarifying example from one specific story, the man with the twisted lip. And then we get a little side thesis about the cultural associations that allowed us to come up with the idea of media addiction in the first place. Here, Zieger does um, a lot of what is commonly known as signposting, so that we can easily find her main contributions and arguments. She clearly states in these two sentences that, quote, this article explores, and quote, I describe. 
um, which is a very lucid and very declarative way of announcing argumentative intention. Before the thesis, we get some preparatory vignettes that clear the ground for these signposted intentions. Um, from the very beginning, in the sign of four, Holmes injects himself uh, with cocaine and lights a pipe to stimulate himself out of boredom. And, second example, in The Red-Headed League, he ponders the end of the case by smoking three pipes full of tobacco in 50 minutes. Zieger reads these scenes as a thematic update of the figure of the sophisticated gentleman leisurely reading, uh, reclining in his chair, smoking a pipe, and consuming the latest news in print. With Holmes, this image has become edgier and closer to a kind of, quote, nervous pathology. So with these preparatory vignettes in mind and Holmes' intervention, we're ready to understand where the thesis comes from and accept that these connections between print and tobacco are actually something worth investigating. So uh, when we get to the thesis, um, it seems that the thesis has an even broader claim that arrives, however, with you know, kind of less preparation. Quote, that part, along the, along the way I described the long cultural association of smoking, reading, and fantasizing that gave rise to the concept of media addiction. So that part I'm claiming we're a little bit less prepared for because the examples we've been given so far are from Sherlock Holmes, and this seems to be a more general claim about the cultural history of media addiction. So that's why I think there's an additional extra paragraph after the thesis about the history of mass literacy and media consumption. So in this bonus paragraph after the thesis, uh, we get a quick history of media addiction from women being accused of, be, uh, of, of being addicted to trashy novels early on in the 19th century, uh, to everyone just becoming addicted to ephemeral to-the-minute journalism by the end of the 19th century. Ephemeral reading was measured out in quick puffs of the tobacco pipe, modulating between moments of stimulation and moments of sedation. So these par paradoxical rhythms of addictive behavior can be seen in that first figure of Holmes curled up in his chair, smoking his tobacco pipe. There's, um, if you look at that image, there's both a kind of nervousness to that image, um, the cradled legs perhaps, and a sign of the intense pleasure of thought and deduction going on upstairs with the detective's mind and his characteristic prop, the pipe. As promised, I'm skipping to the very last section titled Conclusion Tobacco Papers. So from the beginning of that section, we get many more details about the link between the image of tobacco smoking and the rise of mass consumption of, quote, um, light literature and ephemeral matter. Um, if you're not quite sure what uh, this kind of literature was, the best approximation nowadays uh, would be just to all the stuff that we're raven ravenously binge watching on streaming services. As Zieger explains, she's talking about a mass media, quote, that had grown to epic proportions and invaded domestic life. Um, and this became, quote, impossible to quit. So this kind of ephemeral literature was about um, what Zieger calls imitation and unoriginality. Um, but it's still somehow, quote, unleashed unquenchable appetites for imagined worlds of representation. So this, as I mentioned before, should sound familiar. We now watch the same Marvel movie over and over again with minimal variations. Uh, there seems to be an algorithmic formula for Netflix TV shows. Um, but despite all that, we can't seem to get enough of all the imitative and unoriginal stuff. We keep watching it. So to, to describe this phenomenon of media addiction, the critics that she cites from the late 19th century all rely on the image of rolling up tobacco papers for easy, quick, consumable, and addictive fun. So none of this quick lit had any, quote, meaningful perspective, but it just, quote, enabled a self-conscious mode of reading based on the pleasure of recognition. So we don't have to think too hard about it, in other words. Uh, we know pretty much all the narrative beats of a Harry Potter story, for example. There's the call to adventure, reluctance to take up the call, heroic taking up of the call nonetheless, 
twist is that someone or something bad actually turns out to be something good. Um, and, and then finally, good triumphs over evil. So this is what Ziegler means by, quote, a mode of reading based on the pleasure of recognition. There's a kind of comforting formula to it, and that recognition of the formula is actually addicting. Um, but, but this is really not Ziegler throwing shade at media consumption because it was the result of an important democratizing development of mass literacy. The radical press in the 1810s, syndicated fiction by the 1870s, cheap journalism by the 1880s, etc. More information, more words were reaching more and more people. So instead of wagging her finger at all of this, there's more of a kind of smirk than a judgy face here, um, as we see in her pointed reference to Magritte's famous image of the surreal pipe. So Holmes, then, is Zeger's perfect image of a character that encapsulates this linkage between quickly consumable literature and tobacco addiction. The detective stories themselves had become this kind of quickly consumable, predictable, and formulaic entertainment. And people just couldn't get enough. So just think of uh, all the procedural shows that we have nowadays and the public's insatiable desire for more. Um, and this includes me. Um, we, we love to consume this formula no matter how dated or predictable it is. Holmes becomes just like his cigarette. As Zeger puts it, quote, his affinity with the paper makes him resemble it, pale, thin, pressed, used up. The character has uh, had, had taken up a self-referential and self-propagating celebrity beyond even Arthur Conan Doyle, the author. Doyle actually grew super tired of his character and wanted to kill the character off, but the public revolted and eventually demanded a reboot, um, and they were successful in that demand. We had become too dependent, too addicted to him. And what we get from this overview of Zeger's argument is that addiction, again, is really not an objective category that we suddenly discovered the truth of. It actually has a much more complicated and weirder contextual history. It turns out one of the earliest ways we came to understand addiction was not through medical science, but through our dependencies on trashy ephemeral literature like the Sherlock Holmes stories. <laughs>